Hey everyone, welcome back to Make It Happen Mondays, where we talk about sales, business, entrepreneurship, personal growth, mental health, and everything in between with guests who I truly respect and I think make a positive impact on the world around us. And this was a fun conversation I just had with Brandon Clausier. He actually is an enterprise AE over at Asana, but started his career in sales with no money, no college degree, and grinded his way all the way up to being a top enterprise sales rep over at Salesforce and now over at Asana, making President's Club. And during this conversation, we talk about a lot of stuff, but it it really centered around um, him growing up with a real strong work ethic with his parents and kind of what they taught him. Uh, about financial literacy and business acumen and then realizing college just really wasn't for him and he was washing dishes one day and um, his roommate was uh, a telemarketer and he asked him how much he made per meeting and that was more than he made in a week of washing dishes so he was like all right i gotta get into this and he got into it worked his ass off and we talk about stuff like you know you never know who's watching because his next opportunity came from a boss who we had had previously and saw his work ethic and we hit in you know about being direct versus rude and figuring out what that balance line is uh, how he got to salesforce um, personal branding and how important that is what he learned from salesforce in general and also the future of sales and, and what it really means and what sales reps should be paying attention to. So I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Let's make it happen. What's happening, Make It Happen family? Big shout out to our partners today, Gong, Vidyard, and Chili Piper. Gong's data is more than valuable. It's cornerstone in any organization looking to collect the data that's going to tell them where they can improve and where they need to spend their time making changes. Vidyard makes it easy for people to use videos anywhere. No matter whether you're sending videos in email or on social media, posting them somewhere, or sending them in a DM, Vidyard has got you covered. Our friends at Chili Piper are so much fun to be around. They make it easy for people to get on your calendar. And Every sales rep has got to have this function locked in. It's one of the most important things we can do as a seller. How can I get you on my calendar easily? Chili Piper can make that happen for you. Be sure that you're checking out all these great tools. And now let's pass it over to John to find out who's joining him today. See you soon, everybody. Brandon, what's going on, my friend? I'm waiting for my little Adam Vinatieri uh, card in the mail, and uh, you had part of that used to bribe your way onto the podcast. I'm just joking, but I'm really interested in your story. How you doing, brother? Hey, I'm doing great, man. And absolutely, I know you're a big Pats fan, and I had an old collection of uh, football cards collecting dust. So I was going to say, what can I dig up here to get John to pay attention? And clearly it worked. So thanks for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And that, it is a testament to people out there. You know, you, I, you, I get a lot of requests, obviously, to be on the podcast. People tell their story book or whatever it is. I don't pay attention to most. Um, or I, I always pay attention, but it's just most of them like, okay, whatever. Um, but, you know, you do something to stand out even a little bit, right? Uh, the personalization. We talk about that on email and prospecting and just kind of not being like personalized just to be personalized, but being personalized with a purpose, right? And relevance. So it definitely helped you stand out. Let's put it that way. And, and you're here. So it worked one way or the other. <laughs> Absolutely. Glad it worked. And that's in the mail, by the way. So it should be there yeah. soon. I love it. Um, so Brandon, let's talk. I mean, you, you, I mean, looking at your background and stuff, um, you know, one of the things we talk a lot about on this, on this podcast is, is about growth, right? Personal growth, professional growth, development, um, always with an angle of sales. And I genuinely believe that sales, you know, when done right is the greatest profession in the world when done wrong, I think it's one of the worst. And you got a pretty interesting background going from basically dead broke and, and, you know, a telemarketer out of job all the way up to Salesforce and, and president's club there and now working over at Asana. So could you kind of walk us Back up a little bit, though, before we get to the career part of this, like walk us through you growing up, like what, what kind of like real family background do you got there? Because I always like to kind of peel back a little bit of the layers of onions of where motivation comes from and those type of things. So could you give us a little bit of perspective on kind of how you grew up, where you grew up and then how you got into sales and then we'll take it from there? Yeah, sure. So I grew up in the town of Chico, California. So uh, if any of you ever heard of the beer Sierra Nevada, that is where uh, that beer comes from. And I actually grew up on a farm. It was uh, 40 acres of uh, almonds. So I grew up on a 40 acre almond farm. Um, And I was in a mixed family, the youngest of six, actually. So um, my one of my my stepdad was actually a CPA. And then my dad was actually a, a financial advisor. So I had a very good mix of the, you know, analytical side and the sales and the business side growing up. And 
saw all the hard work that CPAs put in a tax season and then learned a lot about sales and money and stocks and business um, from my dad, right? Just waking up every morning and he'd have, you know, all the stock shows going and Jim Cramer. Obviously, I was younger going through 08 and 09. So I remember that period very vividly. And I always kind of knew money was something that was important to me, right? I would, I would watch the movies and see the really big houses and see people live in their dreams. And that's always something that I really um, wanted to do. So that's actually where I was born. And, uh, you know, pretty normal high school kid, you know, played football, loved to hang out with my friends, uh, loved to get outside um, and do things like that. I never really did like school, though. <laughs> I can never really understand the point of it. But uh, yeah, pretty. that was basically, you know, how I grew up, a small town kid. And, um, you know, I think a lot of where I'm at today has to do with just the fact that, you know, I grew up kind of didn't have too much, but, you know, all the parents worked really hard in the family and I knew the hard work was important. I got a question for you. Do you think work ethic is, uh, is something you, uh, basically grow up, um, experiencing? So therefore you, you have strong work ethic, or do you think you can create a stronger work ethic later on in life and how much harder it is? Yeah. For me, work ethic was created out of necessity, right? <laughs> uh, you know, I really wanted to be successful and I wasn't, you know, really all in on the school route. So I knew that in order to get where I wanted to go, I was going to have to work um, really hard. But I think it goes both ways, right? Because there's people that come from very, very wealthy families where their parents have worked really hard to get where they at and they don't have a very good work ethic. But there's people from those same families that work just as hard as their parents. So I think it truly really has to do with, you know, your per your personal circumstances and kind of what's important to you. Yeah, I think that that's the one thing that I'm a little bit nervous about right now. Because, you know, I feel like an old man saying it, right? But back in my day type of shit, the, the work ethic piece, because there are so many more options for kids coming out of school these days, um, Richard Harris has actually a really good talk track around this about how, you know, us Gen Xers, we, we crap on millennials and Gen Z a lot, but a lot of that comes from jealousy, right? Because we just didn't have those resources. We didn't have those opportunities when we were kids. Um, but I do see, you know, there's, there's too many questions I get about like basically looking for the silver bullet, right? Like, you know, how can I skip my ways to success as opposed to, don't get me wrong. I think you can skip a few steps here, but you can't skip a ladder. You know what I mean? To get in there. So what are you just from your perspective that you see in your peers? Do you, are you seeing the same thing as far as too many people looking for too many shortcuts or are you seeing the opposite where they're, they're willing to work, they're willing to put in the effort, but they're just not willing to do it for shit that they don't believe in? Yeah, I think that our generation particularly has always looking for the next hack or always looking for the next shortcut or always looking for the way to grow faster and get into that position. And I think it's just the way that we've been conditioned with like advertising and phones in our hand, you know, as you grow up, you know, constant advertising. I think we just kind of been trained that way. So I don't think it's anybody's fault of their own. I just think this consumerism mindset we have in America is like we want instant gratification. And if we have to put in a lot of work to get it, then we're not as interested in it. I, I, I co totally agree with that. I, like I said, I'm not placing blame anywhere. I actually, you know, the whole conversation around everybody gets a trophy, everybody craps on the kids for wanting the trophies, but yeah. who were the ones who gave them the trophies? You know what right. I mean? Like, I remember when I was growing up, if I lost, my dad was like, suck it up, try to go fucking win. You know what I mean? Right. But, but being a parent now with a 12 year old daughter and, you know, when she fails, it's, it's hard to watch that. You know what I mean? But you got to hold back that trophy for participation so that they have something to strive for. Um, so again, I, I, I appreciate that, that comment because I don't think it's anybody's fault. I just think I'm concerned about the, the lack of patience, um, for success, if you will. Um, knowing that you're going to have a 40, 50 year career, if you, uh, you know, if, if nothing else doing something, uh, so you, hopefully you find something you're passionate about and you can get there, but skipping too many steps to get there, I think is a, is a dangerous approach. So let's talk about your steps, right? Um, you got out, uh, you got into sales cause you said you weren't really all that, you know, school, same thing with me. Like I worked my ass off in school, but I just, I was like, this is dumb. Um, but I was doing what I was supposed to do, right? That's, I was kind of in that mentality. Okay. I'm supposed to go to school, supposed to get a, um, but you started in inside sales with a construction group, right? And then a few other companies. So walk us through kind of how you got into it and then kind of what happened along the way to make you that broke ass, uh, telemarketer looking for work <laughs> and trying to figure out that next stage. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, what made me the broke ass telemarketer was when I was 18, I had saved up a couple thousand dollars and I decided it'd be a great idea to live in Hawaii. So I moved oh. to Maui, lived in Hawaii for a year. Uh, I was a bus boy, you know, a server, worked three or four jobs, and I would just blow all my money like partying on the beach, having a good time. Uh, you know, I, had, I think I had a roommate or two at the time and was really just enjoying it. But after a while, I was broke, I was working really hard, and I knew I wanted to do something different. And, and Hawaii was a little bit too slow for me. So I moved back to my hometown of Chico, California, which I referred to earlier. I was living in an apartment with like three of my buddies. I was living on, you know, living in the kitchen actually and and, and the couch. So going back and forth. And I was washing dishes at a Mexican restaurant. And I think that that time that was 2013 or 2014, 2013 minimum wage was like seven bucks, seven fifty an hour in California. But there was this guy next door and his name was Jordan. And he was a telemarketer. And he told me that for every appointment that he set that sold, he made 150 bucks. And in my mind, I was like, holy shit, you know how many dishes I would have to wash to make <laughs> 150 bucks? That's like it's yep. like a day and a half worth of work. So I had this old like 1988 Lincoln Town car and I would drive him to work every day trying to get a job at this telemarketing firm. So after like the third try, they eventually hired me and that's how I got my start in sales. So I was making like 300 to 400 dials a day on an auto dialer. It would just beep, you know, the person's name would come up. And then we would set appointments to sell walk-in bathtubs and energy efficient windows. So the whole pitch was like, hey, can you go to your window? Do you feel heat coming? Do you have that uh, those aluminum? Like, let, let our guy come over and give you a demonstration of our product. So it wasn't like this big strategic plan I had to get into sales. It was just kind of out of necessity because I didn't want to wash dishes anymore. <laughs> love it. It's almost like, and I hate this as a sales movie, but I love the movie. Um uh, Wolf of Wall Street, Glengarry, Glen Ross, and, Bo- and Boiler Room. Uh, but Wolf, Wolf of Wall Street specifically. Remember when uh, Jonah, whatever, he goes up, he's like, can I ask you how much you made, you know, last week or whatever? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, 71000 He's like, what the fuck? You know, he's like, I will quit my, if you show me a check right now, I will quit my job right, right now. now and come over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's funny how exactly. that, like, it's funny. I've talked to a lot of people on the podcast and and, and there's a lot of, A lot of similarities with people who just really didn't even think of sales as a career or anything like that. It it ends up being a conversation with somebody on a plane or a neighbor or whatever. And then they kind of do the, huh, wait a minute, how much money do you make and what do you do? Like, holy shit, I didn't even know that was a possibility, right? And I think that's the, what I'm trying to do is is get more people to, I think you and I are on the same page as far as college is concerned. I think it's a, it's a great social education, but it's not a, it, it's a meaningless actual education unless you know exactly what you want to do. So I think kids before they even go to college should understand at least what sales is all about so they can have an option. Right. They say, hey, maybe, yeah, if I know what I want to do, then fine. I'm going to go get a college degree and, you know, go three hundred thousand dollars worth of debt and kind of live my life that way. Or if I don't know, maybe I go make a few bucks with sales, figure things out a little bit and then decide to go learn something. Right. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, I think our parents naturally try to protect their children. And I think 30 or 40 years ago, like going to school, getting a really good job, uh, that was a great ROI, like a college degree had a great ROI. But now it's just you're not getting that return on investment like you used to. And the cost has gone up significantly, right? So you're going in for three or four years, you're coming out with anywhere from 50 to 200,000 or more, you know, dollars worth of debt, then you go to business school, and that's another, you know, 50 or $100,000. So you're starting your career at 23, 24, 25, and $400,000 of debt. And for me, by the time I was 22, I had made $382,000 in W-2 income. So what a difference of a spread from being in $300,000 in debt to being, you know, $380,000 in the positive, plus all of the experience that I got, which allowed me to become an enterprise account executive at the age of 28, right? So looking back on it, um, at the time, I was like, wow, this is terrible. I can't believe I'm a telemarketer. Uh, But, you know, now I'm super grateful for how everything unfolded. And do you think, let me ask you about cold calling here for a minute. Um, Cause there's, you know, obviously it's diminishing returns these days. People aren't picking up the phones, whatever. Uh, but when people say is cold calling dead, I always say no, obviously it's part of the equation, but I actually think the biggest value of cold calling, quite frankly, is those first two to three years in sales when you're brand new. Um, because I just feel like you, you need to go through that 
to to take your lumps to re, to realize what rejection is to look for that needle in the haystack to be able to carry a you know keep a conversation carry a conversation so almost regardless of the outcome of the cold call and whether you hit your numbers or not I still believe that cold calling is a is an essential part of a sales rep's growth um, what are your thoughts on that. Absolutely. And I think it's, you know, it makes me a little bit sad to see so many SDRs and BDRs today just hiding behind like outreach sequences, right? And they're like, oh, I can set four or five meetings off of the outreach sequence. But when you become an AE, you're going to be paid in your direct and your ability to set meetings with executives and communicate with them in fact effectively, right? So when you're on the phone every day, you're making those calls, you're learning how to get those high value meetings. You're exactly right. It develops character. It develops grit, right? And it kind of creates this, I don't want to say, what's the right word? It creates this machine where you're willing to do whatever it takes to be successful. So when I look back on like the single hardest job that I ever had, by far it was that first telemarketing job. So every single role after that, I was like, oh, this is easy. Like I get to talk to executives who are smart and understand business rather than, you know, like a six-year-old homeowner. <laughs> so I think <laughs> yeah. you're right. I just think it develops you as a professional. You learn how to communicate effectively. It develops that grit. And um, I think we're slowly losing that. And I think eventually people will start to pay the price a little bit as they make maybe that transition from an SDR or a BDR to an AE where you're going to have to be doing a lot more of those things. Yeah, I, I also think that, that that's going to lead to a lot of SDRs and BDRs not necessarily getting into sales. You know what I mean? And having that role roll up under marketing and operations and that type of thing where you're really, you, you are looking at data, you are running sequences, but it's much more of a marketing function than an, uh, a sales function. Um, and we'll go back to full cycle sales, so really supported by true ABM and, and everything else. That's just kind of my theory of what I'm watching right now. But but to your point, having the skills to be an AE is having the ability to talk at, you know, real quick, get your value proposition, hold people's attention, engage. So being able to do that, it's like going back to education. Um, I used to crap on it a lot, especially like stuff like calculus, right? I'm like, who the hell needs right. calculus, right? But Absolutely. what was really interesting- I never got that far. Yeah, <laughs> I, I did and didn't go much further. Let's put it that way. Um, but Neil deGrasse said this that got my eyes opened up a little bit. He said, you know, everybody craps on calculus. It's completely irrelevant. Nobody ever uses it except for mathematicians and stuff. He goes, but what people don't understand is the, just the simple act of trying to figure out calculus is wiring your brain in a way that is going to help you in the future because the, 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 the connections that your brain is making to figure calculus out is you problem solving. And so it actually is extremely beneficial, not because you're ever going to use calculus, but because you're figuring out calculus and that just that alone is going to put you in a position to be able to figure things out better down the road. And when he said that, I was like, damn, that's actually a really good point. And it's the same thing with cold calling to my, in my opinion. Well, do you have to do cold calling right now to be successful in sales? Mm, no, not really. No, you can, you can get away with LinkedIn and cadences and sequences and all that other stuff with no phone if you really want to. But can you ultimately be a well-rounded, really good sales professional that knows how to carry a conversation without cold calling? I don't know. You know, who knows? But let's talk about uh, Salesforce. So you, so you kind of, you, you, you started in, you know, selling <laughs> uh, to individuals and then you kind of evolved and it looks like you went, what is it, Smart Zip after that or Coffee Table or something like that? Yeah. So what happened was I was a telemarketer. I got a job at a really small tech firm called Coffee Table in Chico. It's like a four-person company. And uh, I worked there for about eight months and I went from, you know, being a telemarketer to speaking with VPs of marketing and directors of e-commerce. We had a, basically a catalog application where we take paper catalogs, put them on our app and we had 130,000 monthly active users and we pull a um, affiliate commission from that. So that's really where I learned how to like write emails, how to run discovery calls. I met my first mentor, Andrew March there. And there was a director of sales, Holly, at the time who had left to go down to the Bay Area and work at SmartZip Analytics, which at the time was like the 42nd fastest growing uh, software company um, in the world that particular year. And she went down there and she knew my work ethic. She knew what I was about. And she was like, hey, this kid's 20 years old, but, you know, he's a grinder. He really knows how to sell. You should at least give him a chance. So um, that's how I got my first big shot. And I would like full cycle software sales down in the Bay Area. Uh, so they interviewed me on the phone on a Monday and uh, I was in the office on a Friday actually interviewing for the job. So I was there from nine o'clock in the morning to five o'clock at night. 
Uh, they grilled me. And at the end, they just came in and said, you know what, Brandon, you're a really great guy. We just think there's a lot of risk with your age and we'll just have to get back to you. And I said, hey, look, with all due respect, I drove down four hours to be here. If you'd like to offer me the job, go ahead and do it. If not, you know, I don't think this is going to be a really good fit for me. So they came back with an offer letter about 10 minutes Love later, it. Jonathan Love McGowan. It, it was, I think, $40,000 base salary, 80000 OTE. And uh, man, I couldn't be more excited. I was ecstatic. <laughs> Well, you did something there, and I think people people don't realize you did something there. You closed that that most people don't, right? right? And I actually used to test reps when I would interview them. I would I would end every I, you know the whole conversation when I was would interview early in my career would be like I'd say closing probably fifty times during the interview. I'd be like, "Is a closing goal? Closing, 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 closing." And I would literally end every conversation the exact same way. Thanks so much for coming, in, Brandon. We'll be in touch. And if you literally just got up and were like, okay, thanks so much for the interview. I'm looking forward to hearing back from you and walked out the door. I don't care how right. good that interview went. I was not hiring you. If you were not picking no. up what I was putting down right there, like, come on. But all I wanted somebody to do was, great, John, how did I do? Would you recommend me to the next stage? That type of thing. And if you showed just that piece of it, right? Because at the end of the day, if you don't ask for what you don't, you don't get what you what you don't ask for, right? And so for you, was that a... Was that a conscious thing in that moment where you were you thought about the clothes or was that just an authentic you were like, look, dude, I drove four hours. I spent eight fucking hours here talking to you at this point. You're either, you know what I mean? Like, cause that's part of me. Like I do sometimes cross that line where I'm just like, I don't fucking care. Cause I, you know, whatever. So I'm just gonna say what comes out of my mouth. Other times I'm very calculated because I actually want the thing. So what let me ask you on that moment. Was that a calculated conscious thing you said, or was that just something you being you because you just, you had kind of been through enough? I think it was a little bit of both, but it was more just me being me. And I really wanted that job. So I was like, look, if you're yeah. going to hire me, let's make it happen and uh, let's do it. So it. yeah, it was a little bit of both, but I think that's a really good point. Um, and hopefully listeners can get a little bit out of that. I think for every role that you're interviewing for, not just a sales role, right? Like if you're a C, if you're a CSM, if you're an SE, if you're interviewing for an executive role, whatever it is, the ability to close on an interview is so important. And I've heard from so many managers and so many of my peers and the own, my own interviews I've conducted, people just don't close even in sales role. And it's just astonishing to me. So I think that's a really good call out and something that's really important, especially with a lot of people, you know, looking for new roles right now. Well, it's, a, it's that defined next step too. It's that you forget about the interview for, for your whatever job it is. It's also in sales, right? I mean, you know how few people in sales actually get a defined next step locked in when they're talking to a client? Nine times out of 10, most reps after a demo, after, a, you know, whatever, are like, okay, cool, Brandon. So what are the next steps? What do you think? And, you'll, you, and the client says, oh, you know, we'll be in touch. See you later. Yeah, you know, I'll send you an email. Thanks. I'll send <laughs> you an email. And all they really have to do is 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 either Sandler upfront contract and and set the stage for the close or close and say. And, and I'm not talking about stuffing it down somebody's throat here. Is you going to buy? Just close on the next step. Hey, so when do you want to schedule a call? You got your calendar in front of you. Why don't we pick a time? We'll throw it on the calendar if we have to reach it. You know, but nobody does that. Is it? Do you think that the people are just afraid to close because they don't want to come off as sounding salesy, or do you think that people? Um, just genuinely don't like to ask the awkward question. I think it's people don't want to ask the awkward question. It's so painful for them to ask that question. They'd rather not get the next step and have to actually go through that. Um, for me, you know, it was, like I said, from that first experience, it was ingrained in me, right? So yeah. I was like, this is easy. <laughs> but yeah, it's just, easy right? you know, pe people don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to, you know, they don't want to come off as salesy. But I think prospects actually really appreciate or customers actually really appreciate when the salesperson does define next steps, right? You define the next steps, you close on those next steps, you put that in the email. I think that's just being a professional. I mean, that's your job. That's what you're supposed to do. Well, I think there's a fine line between being direct and being rude, you know, and, and, and unfortunately, you kind of have to cross the rude barrier every once in a while to figure out what that line is. But being direct, especially at the executive level, right? And we'll, we'll talk about your experience as an account executive at AE and talking to those executives, but especially executives, the more direct into the point you can be with them, the more they'll respect you. The more you let it in, in, you know, even even controlling the conversation is the same thing with agendas, right? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you straight up, if there's not an agenda for the call, I, like if you're meeting with me, right, I'm going to take over this conversation because I'm an A, you know, I got an A type personality. I'm an executive. My time's valuable, quote unquote. And if there's no structure to it, I'm just going to take this conversation however I want to take this. And there's good luck trying to 
rail me in, right? But if you give me a structure and an agenda, hey, John, thanks for your time. Here's a few things I want to make sure that we cover. What else do you want to make sure that we add? And I know where in this conversation my thing is going to be addressed. I usually just sit and wait. You know what I mean? Because like it, it, I wrote a blog post a while ago called executives are like children. They need structure, right? And that structure is what's direct, whereas like a script would be rude. You know what I mean? Like me rolling you through a script and saying stop and whatever, that, that to me is rude. Or closing hardcore with, with no real structure to it is, is rude. But that direct factor I think is critical. Have you ever, have you always been a pretty direct person? I have. I've actually had to learn to dial it back a little bit, like you said, because coming, you know, from my first couple of roles, I was so direct that I had to learn to be a little bit less direct, a little bit more cordial and learn to be a little bit more tactical. But I absolutely agree with you in terms of like setting the agenda, I think showing up on time. Um, you know, don't wear your hoodie to a call with an executive. I think there's a lot of little things that we're missing now as we move in this virtual environment that are really important. And then, you know, how I learned the executives were so direct was because every single time they would reply to my email, it'd be like two or three words. So now when I go back and forth with, with executives, it's like, yes, no, this time works, this time does it. And so I just kind of mirror that language with them. And I think they really appreciate that. Love it. So let's talk about how how'd you decide you wanted, was Salesforce something that uh, you you aspired to or did it come to you? Uh, and walk me through that journey of getting that job because it ain't easy, especially 2019 when you started. Um, you know, I think Salesforce a while ago was hiring anybody and everybody, you know, anybody with a pulse. And then they really shifted to really being very hard on their hiring on, on who was coming in and who was going out. So First and foremost, though, was Salesforce on your kind of aspiration list or did somebody come knocking and saying, hey, you should, you know, we got jobs here at Salesforce? Well, it was both. I mean, who wouldn't want to work at Salesforce and have that name on your resume? I never really thought it was a possibility. It's funny, every single role that I have, even my role now at Asana, was from a referral at a previous company. So I spent the past five years, um, four or five years at SmartZip. And there was actually a manager at the time. His name was Joe Reagan. And he left to go to Salesforce. So he called me one day and he was like, hey, Brandon, I know you'd be great here. You don't have a degree. So we're really going to have to fight to get around that. But I'd love to have you on my team. So if it wasn't for him, if it wasn't for him seeing my work ethic, for him seeing my production, for him seeing me in the office every day and developing a relationship with him, then I never would have got that chance. But um, that's really good what kind of got my foot in the door to be able to interview at Salesforce was just that, um, you know, connection. If I just would have, you know, tried to prospect into the hiring manager or submit my resume, I just really don't think there's any way I ever would have got a shot. Well, that, and that's an important point too. It's like, I, you, it's almost like, you know, you never know who's watching, right? Obviously your direct manager was watching, but because of that work ethic that you had put in, in a, you know, in that role, when they went to the next one, you know, Hey, that's the type of kid I want on my team. So I think a lot of people out there, they miss that. Um, they miss, they, they, they're too, uh, I don't say selfish, but too focused on themselves versus what the perception is of them. Right. And, and doing things, uh, so that they, you know, just for the, just because they want to do it and want to get better at it. It's amazing how much it, it, myself and other leaders that I know pay attention to the little things that necessarily aren't something I'm going to pull you aside and say, Brandon, great job for, but, oh, it's six o'clock, six fifteen in the afternoon and Brandon's still at his desk doing some shit. You know what I mean? While everybody else is gone. Okay. Mental note. You know what I mean? Like that type of stuff. Yes. And I think it's hard in the, in the, in the virtual environment here, but what are your suggestions to some of the, the, the people out there who are kind of just in a situation where they're like, probably not too happy, right? It, you know, they're kind of a little worried right now and they don't feel like they're getting exposed uh, so that they can get that certain recognition to give them that push in there. Any suggestions that you have for people on uh, kind of doing the work without broadcasting it and telling everybody you're doing the work and kind of earning it, but still promoting yourself in a lot of ways? Yeah. So I think you nailed it, right? That job that I had at coffee table when I was 19, my first real software sales job that wasn't telemarketing, that director of sales got me to SmartSip. If I never would have got to SmartSip, I never would have got to Salesforce. If I never would have got to Salesforce, I wouldn't be an enterprise AE at Asana. So I think whatever role that you're at right now, First and foremost, develop the work ethic, develop the habits, because those are going to carry you. But to your point, people are watching. And getting to the office 45 minutes early, I had northern New Jersey as my territory. 
right? So I got to get to the office at 4.30 a.m. There was nobody at the office at 4.30 a.m., but I would get there every single day, and Joe saw that, right? So he knew my work ethic. He knew what I was all about. And I think the other thing that is really important, especially if you're in a role where you are in person, is prospect with an audience, right? So one thing that I did early on in my sales career, and a lot of my colleagues didn't really like it at first, but the managers and directors did, is I made my sales calls, my prospecting calls, did my demos loud and proud with my stand-up desk in the middle of the sales floor. I wanted everybody to know I was on the phone. If I was going to close, I wanted all the smoke if I didn't close, right? And I really just thrived off of that energy. And that's really how I built my brand internally. Now I look at it like LinkedIn, especially in the, the virtual environment we're in, is so critical to building your brand. Yes, your personal brand, but also internally. Now I'm remote. I live in San Diego and I work at Asana. And I've been posting on LinkedIn, you know, a lot the past couple of months. And there's been people from all over Asana, all over the world, from Chicago and New York and you name it, that are reaching out to me or we're getting on internal calls saying, oh, Brandon, I love your content. Oh, Brandon, it was so good to read this post. So I love what you're doing uh, to promote yourself and promote Asana there. So I think, you know, if you're in person, do those things that I spoke about. But if you are in a remote role and you are an SDR or you are trying to progress your career, post that script that's working for you. Post a video of yourself making cold calls. Really make sure that everybody can see you because they're probably scrolling LinkedIn half the day as well. What's up, everybody? I know you're enjoying this conversation. John does a great job with genuine curiosity on these episodes, and our guests consistently bring the heat. We want to take a moment here and let you know that you've got an opportunity, an opportunity to become better than you were yesterday. And you can do so by gaining access to all of JB Sales content. All of their training tips, techniques, tactics, and takeaways can be yours for $1 a day. $365 for the year gets you annual access to everything, including our private Slack channel for members only, which you get access to all of us directly 100% of the time, 24 hours a day. And then at the same time, you're going to get access to our bi-weekly Ask Me Anything sessions where you can bring real deals to the table and get the help that you need where you need it. This is very, very important. Sales reps that invest in themselves are often found at the tops of their leaderboards. Join us today and get the help you need to become the seller that you deserve to be. That URL, one more time, is joinjbsales.com. Let's get back to the show with JB and our guest for this week. What do you say to those people who are out there saying, look, I got so much to do right now, man. I, like personal brand building is brutal. Like, I, you know, and, it, and by the way, there's no long, there's no short term uh, results to personal brand building, right? It's definitely a long term play. But what would your suggestion be to, to people who are kind of still on the fence about the personal branding thing? And, oh, why should anybody care about this? Like, what would what would your suggestion be on how to get started uh, for, for that person who's like looking at LinkedIn saying, there's too many people on there right now. It's saturated. You know, I don't, I don't know what I have to say, but I know it's important. But like, is there any suggestions you have to, on how to get started um, in this in this world to build a brand in an authentic way without having to worry too much about growth or any of that stuff? Yeah, I think it's really just an objection that comes down to the fear of judgment, right? So a lot of people that are saying they don't have time to post, they're just afraid of what people are ultimately going to say about them. And also look at it as a way to serve others rather than just making it all about yourself. A lot of people have so much knowledge that's wrapped up inside their brain that they could share with the world to give value and to help people. And you see it over and over again on LinkedIn. So that's what I would say is it's not all about you. Go post on LinkedIn and just try to add values, value to other people's day. And you'll build a community. You know, you'll, you know, people will naturally resonate with your post and you'll, you'll build your brand um, in the process. But um, you know, a big part of my career progression and a big part of getting the job at Asana was posting on LinkedIn. So it's extremely important to me. And as you know, John, I'm sure you've gotten a lot of these messages. When you get a few messages or you get those first few messages of people saying this helped me so much, Brandon, thank you for doing it. Then it's like it almost becomes a responsibility to give back to the community. Totally. I, I think it's it's the opposite of you know, you get it. Well, it's kind of like cold calling, right? Like you get, you, you do a hundred cold calls and you get that one person, you set up that meeting right. and it kind of makes those hundred worth it in a lot of ways, like golf, right? You, you yeah. know, you spend 17, you know, holes, just hacking it into the woods and doing whatever. And then the 18th hole, you just stripe it right down the middle. You're like, right. ah, shit, I'll see you next week, right? <laughs> It's the same thing with personal brand building, right? You post and post and post and, and you get nothing. You get no engagement. Nobody cares, whatever it is. Even you, you, you might even have a few trolls telling you you're an idiot. 
but that one person that finally hits you and says, thank you for posting that, that changed my perspective, that, that got me to think in a different way is worth, that, that wipes out almost every other negative component of what it is. And I always tell people, if you, if, and you never want to say, do this, like tell people what to do, because that comes across as arrogant. But what you do is you share what you've done and whether it's worked or not, right? So you just share your journey. And man, if you just have one person you, you can impact, it'll be worth, I, 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 I mean, I'm speaking from experience here. I, I had some kid tell me the other day that, it, that I saved his life because I was posting about my dad and when my dad passed away and how I was dealing with it and all this other stuff. And he was in a horrible place, uh, about to commit suicide. His mom died, his, his brother died, his you know, wife left him, his job fired him, all this other stuff. And he was listening, he fucking listened to the podcast. And he was like, holy shit, changed his perspective, got back on track, got a job. And I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, if I, if I don't ever do anything again, as far as impact on people's lives, that one right there, shit, that's worth every single fucking minute I spend on this, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's really what it's all about. I haven't gotten any messages that deep, but just people saying, Hey, keep going or I really appreciate yeah, yeah, this yeah. or I use this tip or you help me get this job. I've, I've gotten leads for other reps at my company. I mean, the list goes on. So yeah, I would say do it and it's just going to get more and more competitive. And I think right now is an awesome opportunity to get in there and start building a brand for yourself. What'd you learn about what, what Salesforce teach you? Because uh, kind of from the inside, I've, I've worked with them from the outside, right? But I've never been an in, a, a rep inside of Salesforce. And so what were some of the kind of learning lessons? Because uh, it's such an, it, it, you know, it's such a monster now. Salesforce is such an engine. Um, and it's, you know, it is like herding cats there internally. But what were some of the big takeaways from the Salesforce job that you, 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 you took that were going to help you kind of progress in your career? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that I got from it was I was always the lone wolf. I wanted to do everything on my own in my previous roles. And at Salesforce, I really learned that if you were going to be a top rep there, that you had to unlock the power of your account team, all the different resources, industry resources, because there's so much at your disposal. So being able to digest all of that and align that to what's going to be um, success, you know, make your partners and your customers successful um, is really, really important. So I think that's the biggest thing that <laughs> I learned not to sound uh, like cliche, but just the power of, you know, teamwork and leveraging your account team. And I think the other thing that I learned is solutioning to real, uh, business problems, right? When you sell a point solution, it's like you generally solve like one problem. As you know, John, there's so many different products at Salesforce and there's so many different ways that you can use the platform that it's kind of really up to you to take all of the information about that business, understand what they're trying to do achieve, and then almost like prescribe like a doctor would a solution to that problem. So I think it really forced me to think analytically too. I think it improved my business acumen where I wasn't just calling one persona, selling one problem that solved you know you know or solved one problem at this exact same price like every deal was different the conversations were always different and everything was always fluid so that's something i learned from salesforce the other thing i would just say is like you know how to be a professional it is a corporate environment so you better be to calls on time time everybody's dressed nicely right um you know everybody's showing up and doing their best every single day coming from a startup you didn't have as much as that it was kind of very laid back so i think it kind of cleaned up my professionalism and like the, the corporate maturity, if you will, working at Salesforce for a few years. Interesting. Do you think it's better to start with the corporate and, and then move to startups? Or do you think what you did your path I, and better is a relative term, obviously, but, but I think, you know, a lot of the advice that I, you know, Jack Welsh, when I worked for him, one of his big things is if you don't know what you want to be basically, you know, your first job, go get a brand, go, go work at a corporation with a brand for two reasons. One is you'll learn what it's like to work in the corporate environment. Uh, two is, you know, you'll, you'll have a logo that basically later on when you interview, you don't have to explain. Right. So for me, right. like for instance, my first job was DeWalt. And so when I was interviewing after that, People are like, where'd you work? I say, DeWalt. Oh, okay, cool. I, I understand DeWalt. What'd you do there? Whereas if I would ask you, hey, uh, coffee table, uh, what's what's your experience? You're, now you have to explain what coffee table is, and then you have to explain what you did at coffee table. And I have to kind of guess if coffee table was a legit company or not. So do you think that your progression of like startups and, and going that route and then getting the professionalism was was good for you? Or do you think it's better to kind of learn early on about the structure of corporate and then get to side after that? 
I think for a career progression, like you said, it's better to get those big logos on your resume as soon as possible. I do think, though, that if you're going to spend the beginning part or a lot of you know the early part of your career in a corporate environment and then go into a startup, man, you're in for a big surprise because you have to wear so many hats. All the processes are broken. All the systems are broken. You don't have this plethora of resources and everything kind of laid out for you like you do at Salesforce. So if I would have gone to you know a big company like Salesforce first and then went to like a Series B or C or Series D startup, I would have gotten absolutely crushed. So looking back on it, I'm really glad that it pay, played out the way it did because then when you do get to that job like Salesforce where you have all the resources, you're like, are you serious right now? This is like, I'm in uh, sellers Disneyland. Like I have 50 co-primes. I have industry resources. I can bring executives on the call, like on the calls. Like this is going to be a lot of fun. So that's kind of my perspective on it. No, I like it. I, and again, I don't think there's one that's better than the other. I just think it's an interesting journey one way or the other, right? Because I took the opposite. I, I didn't know what I wanted. So I was like, oh, fuck it, you know, Xerox and yeah. Black & Decker. And then I got to startups and it definitely was a wake up call, but it was in my, it was more in my DNA to be in startups um, like the multiple hats and running around like chaos. Like I didn't like the structured, boring, you know, do what you're supposed to do type of stuff. So, um, but that was because my parents were entrepreneurs without me even knowing it, you know what I mean? Cause back then they didn't call them entrepreneurs. So I, I just, I think I had that gene in me that something didn't fit right with corporate. And when I hit the your own thing, yeah, well, and when I hit the startup world, it just felt it just felt better. You know what I mean? Where people are, other people, the opposite. They're like in the startup, like, this is fucking chaos. I don't know if I like this. And then they go to corporate and they're like, oh, this is, this is better. This is comfortable. You know, there's more comfortable. There's more structure to it. And I can do my thing without having to worry about everything else. And a lot of that has to do with DNA, I think, though. <laughs> yeah. I do think, though, that you get a lot of like invaluable experience when you do have to figure shit out and just, oh, you know, God. make it happen and wear different hats. You get a lot of business experience that you might not otherwise get. So, I'm really thankful for that as well. Yeah, and I think that's that's a that's a great point because you know the figure it out mentality is is lacking in today's world because everything is so structured, right? So, you know, I have this whole talk with Morgan and I when we would do a keynote about why you know how Gen Xers and Millennials can work together, and the answer isn't scripts; the answer is structure. Because when I was growing up, like my parents would kick me out of the house and say, go figure it out. Like just be home by dinner. You know what I mean? Whereas now every kid's life is so structured. They go from school to this hour to this hour. They have soccer practice from this hour. They have their iPad for 30 minutes. Then they have to do homework for two hours. And I see with my daughter, she's 12, right? So you take kid, and by the way, they're taught to the test, right? MCAS and all that stuff. So now you take a kid who has been taught to the test their entire life, given structure their entire life, and then you throw them into the real world with a manager like me. And I say, figure it out. The kids look at you like, you're, you're like, you're crazy. Like, what are you talking about? Figure it out. Tell me what the f to do. And, and the problem is, is the reaction by somebody like me, when you say, I don't know what to do. Okay. Well, here's exactly what to do. Here's a script. Here's a template. And then, and then that's what they do. They do the script, they do the template, but the middle ground of structure like, I don't like being in structure. You put structure on me and I'm going to break it, right? But I like building structure. And what I find is that the, the newer generations coming into the workforce, they will thrive within structure better than I ever would, right? So, but you got to give them guardrails there or else they tend to go off the guardrails and then start doing random ass shit. And it's all over the place. So uh, do you see kind of a similar from your growth and what, I mean, you, you come from a little bit of a different background than a structured, right? You didn't go to college. You kind of grinded your way through. So uh, you're probably a little bit more similar to I am than you would be to kind of the, the masses, if you will, from a generational standpoint. But are you seeing something similar with, with the need for structure? I am. And it's almost like you need to tell people exactly what to do and how to do it or something doesn't get done or, oh, I was doing it. And then I ran into this and it's like, okay, right. well, then what, then what'd you do? Well, I don't know. I was gonna like wait and talk to you about it. And it's like, no, why don't you just like figure it out and like execute on it? So I absolutely see that. And I think you made a really good point. It's taught from a young age, right? From elementary school into college and they get a job and everything's very structured and everything's very by the very by the book. And there's a lot of information they're being told, but not a lot of creative or on the fly thinking. And I think when people get in that environment, sometimes it can be intimidating for them. So I think you're spot on with that. Yeah, it's a, I think it's a generational, I think it's just more of a societal issue. You know what I mean? I mean, you had talked about the dopamine factor of instant gratification and kind of where we're headed. And that's why I think critical thinking and, and those type of things are just so important for kids to be taught. That's why sales to me is, is, is such a great profession for kids. 
because it gets them to think outside that box. It gets them to kind of have to be creative and figure shit out as opposed to knowing exactly how to code, for instance. Like coding, okay, coding, I can code. I go do this, I do this, I add this one, I add this zero type of thing. But sales Actually, I had a question definitely. for you, John. I was yeah. thinking about this exact thing the other day. And I was, and you were, uh, you know, you, you do like maybe you've done probably a lot of trainings where it's like on Zoom and people will just like turn their cameras off right away. Well, a lot of people in my generation and the generation below me, they're on like TikTok all day. They're on like Instagram all day. They're on like LinkedIn all day. Do you see a change in sales enablement going to more like short form type videos where people can quickly digest it versus just sitting through these long two or three hour Zoom trainings? Because in my head, I'm like, that's probably exactly where it's going to go. Oh, hundred percent. I think that there's a difference between live and recorded, right? I, I, the tolerance for long form recorded shit is zero. I mean, just zero. If your video, if your learning video is more than 10 minutes, there's not a shot in hell people are going to watch the whole thing unless they're absolutely forced to. I think you have a little bit more leeway when it's a, a remote learning live. You know what I mean? Like, you know, our, our sessions are an hour and a half, two hours, and we typically with some engagement and that type of stuff, and we kind of force it a little bit. But where I think things are absolutely going um, because of the trends that you mentioned there are it's, it's just in time learning. Right. Where it's not just, it's not now, oh, I need to learn something. Let me go now, take a course. Let me sit and figure this out. There's always going to be a place for that. Right. But I think in general, uh, we're going to be, you're going to be in Salesforce. You're going to be in Asana. You're going to be in LinkedIn. And there'll be a little sidebar that pops up. Like when you have to open and when you have to create an activity or create an opportunity in Salesforce. There'll be a little sidebar where you'll, you'll be at that screen and right there will be, here's how to, you know, create an opportunity and you'll watch it and you'll do it. Or you're about to make a, or, or LinkedIn, right? So, hey, LinkedIn, John Brandon just moved from Salesforce to Asana and he used to be a customer of yours, you know, so now you get an alert to reach out to Brandon. Well, hey, John, before you do that little video. Hey, for people who switch jobs on LinkedIn, make sure you do X, Y, and Z in your message, blah, right? So that's that's where I think things are moving. And it's almost if you think of the, this is why I think a mass, a, a large portion of the sales organization is going to roll up under marketing and operations, like I said before, like a, a very large portion. Um, because the, the real sales rep of the future is going to be like Iron Man or going to be more like, if you picture like a switchboard operator, you know what I mean? Yeah. Where everything funnels yeah. through and they kind of plug the pieces in and they use the resources, but all the technology is servicing up information about you, your personality, what you're doing, knowing talking points, giving me a tip on what to say. And I'm just going to be kind of have this console in front of me with all your personality shit, all your profile stuff, all the reasons I should talk to you. And then the human factor is what I'm going to add to it. So that's where I see things going. I think we're pretty far away from that. I thought we were all going to get replaced by artificial intelligence by like, you know, two, three years ago. But, you know, I got to constantly be pulling my head out of my ass when it comes to SaaS because, you know, I spend most of my time in the SaaS industry. And, you know, you, you take one step out of SaaS and you're in sales 19, circa 1985 all over again for the most part. So I think there is a little bit of a balance before we all get completely replaced. But yeah, that's where it's going. Yeah, I was thinking about it. Even your videos, right, on like Instagram and TikTok, like you deliver a ton of value in like like 15, 30, or even like 60 seconds, right? So, you know, in an hour when I'm watching a whole training, I could watch like 10, 15, or 20, you know, 20 of your videos and then boom, like instantly implement them. Or how many sales reps, you know, throughout the day are looking at Instagram and they could just go and get a few sales tips that help them with their day-to-day -day job. So really interesting to get your thoughts on that. I have like this super high-tech visual now of like all yeah. this different data being in front of us and we're just bringing it together in real time. It's going to be really cool to see how that plays out. It sounds like, it sounds fun, but it'll be it's, it's almost already uh, there, man. It's, yeah. already, it's almost already there with the dashboards and Salesforce that you can pull everything into and, you know, HubSpot or whoever. I mean, but shit like Crystal Nose. I mean, I don't know if you've played around with Crystal Nose where it gives you a disk profile of everybody you're talking to. And I, I have I it. That sounds like, really cool, though. Dude, watch this. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, like, and people listening to it, bear with me here. But, Brandon, I'm going to go on your LinkedIn profile and right here, Crystal Nose. And for those listening, this is a little extra added value for you. Uh, it's Crystal Nose. It's not a drug site. Uh, it's C R Y S T A L K N O W S. But you, Brandon, it tells me here, uh, you're a you're a DI. You're an initiator, visionary, charismatic, and dynamic. Uh, how to communicate, focus on forward thinking goals and the most important decisions that need to be made. Do focus on more high level summaries rather than deep diving on specific questions. Keep the conversation focused on aim at a specific outcome. Don't 
Focus on risk or downside. Prioritize the potential upside. Don't place focus on outdated procedures over focusing on future possibilities. Expected behavior. Take big risks. Speak persuasively in one-on-one -on -one meetings. Elevate, uh, elevating new ideas. Uh, meeting. Remain upbeat and positive. Use whiteboards and or visual aids when possible. Start by casting an exciting vision. Uh, what energizes you? Things, uh, thinking on your feet, experiencing new things, opportunities to perform and entertain. What stresses you? Researching data, repetitive routine tasks, and follow lots of rules. Are those, uh, is that uh, even a little accurate? That's really creepy. A lot of that we just all talked about. <laughs> I've always been right. a D on the disc profile, so I didn't know about the minus, but that's insane. I had no idea about that. That is wild how accurate that is and we just proved that in our conversation for the past 30 minutes <laughs> I mean, and the, the beauty is now brandon i can before i meet with you so i knew this was going to be an easy conversation because you and i are very similar as far as right. we're both high d's right you're a slightly right. higher i than i am that type of thing and if i look at our comparison we're, we're you know risk tolerance skepticism optimistic versus pragmatic fast pace we're pretty close so i don't even have to change my style to to have a conversation with you. Whereas if somebody else is a super high S or super high C or something like that, I need to change my approach because I might run right over them with me being like, gah, gah, you know, in your face all the time. Right. And so picture your, your, your crystal nose profile here, all your social profiles here with all the latest posts that you've done, um, some insights on your business that are giving me triggers on everything that's happened in your business. And then some analytics on intent data of what you've done for the webinars and all that stuff all in a dashboard, all right at my disposal. So when that phone call, I, I can, now I just need to know how to say something that's with all this stuff that's meaningful, which is where the human comes in, right? Cause I, you know, until computers buy from computers, look, look once computers buy from computers, we're, we're fucked, okay? But as, as long as there's a person <laughs> on the other end of that line, then the human factor has to be in there, but it's it's going to be consolidated quite a bit with, through the use of technology, and which is what I, which is why I'm trying to get reps to wake up a little bit to pay attention because if they are the ones that you mentioned where you know they're relying on the sequences and the cadences too much and they're just going through the motions, those are the ones that are without question going to get replaced. Yeah, in 2014 at SmartSip, I took one of the first ever outreach demos. It was like a revolutionary technology. They were presenting pricing off of a PowerPoint presentation with like two or three different options. And I think his name is Mark. He was a VP of sales at the time. He's really big now on LinkedIn. He was the one actually pitching an individual rep, like begging me to introduce me to my sales director so he could sell it to everybody. So just from 2014 to where we're at now, technology has just gone crazy. And so I think your perspective on that is really cool. And it'll be kind of fun um, how that all plays out. But just like we talked about earlier, we can't lose sight of the human element. Because even with all of that data, all the information, all the automation, you still have to be able to connect with people on a real and authentic and personable level. And I think, like you said, more and more people will lose that because they'll just hide behind the technology. So that's why I'm thankful, you know, I started when I did, because I think once you learn those skills, they, they don't, they don't, you know, they don't go away. Well, the other one that I think is very obvious in your background, and I think your dad did a you know good job just by being exposed to it in a lot of osmosis, is the business acumen component to this, right? I don't think you need to be a, an expert in your product or service in order to be able to be a great sales professional. I think you need to know enough to be able to pull in the right pieces to be able to solve the problem. But I think if there's anything that I would recommend people improve, it's business acumen. Because if you can have a business conversation with somebody about what challenges, where the economy is going, what they're like that, then you'll find the problems. But if you're if you're just going through Bant or Medic, or, you know, you're going through the motions, just looking for whatever that next step is, and you're going to miss out on the ability, the, the chance to really have an impact and really help people, and i.e., therefore, really sell. Uh, and, and do the right thing. So it's I think you talked about that where, you know, nobody from Salesforce Marketing Cloud, you don't have to remind me, but nobody from Salesforce Marketing Cloud reached out to you and they never thought you would spend $100,000 on Salesforce Marketing Cloud, but you want to do something for your daughter or was attached to something that's really personal for you. And you're like, wow, they totally missed it because they were just using, you know, Medic and Bant on me the whole time. If they actually would have dug deep enough to understand why it was important to me personally, they would have had a huge deal. And I think we continue to miss that. And you even use that as an example in your own business.
Yeah. I mean, I remember that story, you know, it was a while ago, but yeah, it was like, you know, the amount of money that I had spent on marketing automation platforms and trying to do what I was doing. I mean, for a three person company, I think I dropped like a hundred to $150,000. Now, most people look at a third, three person company and say, fucking this ain't worth my time, but you spend five minutes and you take your head out of your ass and you ask some actually thoughtful questions and you never know. Um, or you never know where that person, if you can help them out in the short term, that might not be able to afford what you have, will come back and be that person that hires you at the next company they go to or whatever, or going back to that theme that we talked about, you don't know who's watching, right? So. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a, that's another thing that's really important, especially with technology. Now that 10 person company, they might need a portal or a community that has 5,000 people. They could spend four or $500,000 with you, right? So spot on. Love it, man. Well, look, let's, uh, we're coming up on time here, Brandon. What else? Anything we missed that, uh, that you wanted to get across? And then we can talk about how people can get in touch with you. But any other kind of things that pop in your head that you wanted to uh, chat about before we get off? Yeah, I would just say that if anybody is uh, you know, in a position where they don't have a college degree and they're looking to break into tech sales and they just want some help or they want some encouragement, or really if there's anything I can do to like help or be a service to you, please feel free to reach out to me like John and I talked about. Um, that's what it's all about. So you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm all over TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, you name it. Love it. And it's Brandon, and I'm going to spell the last name for all of you listening. It's C-L-A-U-S-E-R. Uh, Brandon, do you have a specific handle that people can go check out? I mean, obviously LinkedIn goes to your name, but is there what's your handle on TikTok and Instagram and all those? Uh, it's Brandon J. Clauser. So Brandon J. Clauser for all my social platforms. All right, perfect. And check him out. Uh, he's got a lot of great content. And again, for those of you who kind of looking at, you know, I think about 25% of our audience is is non-sales oriented, right? Or people curious about sales. And I think, Brandon, you're, you're proof positive that you don't need a degree in sales. You actually don't even really need a lot of experience in it. You just need to give a shit and be willing to put in the effort, right? You just need the intangibles. Love it. Awesome, Brandon. Well, thank you so much for coming on, man. I appreciate it. John, I'm super stoked. Thanks for having me, man. This was really fun. Absolutely. And for everybody else out there, um, look, I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did and got to think a little bit differently, maybe about a few things, get to do some, some things differently as well. Uh, but like I always said, um, uh, if you're having a bad day uh, or if you think you're having a bad day, go out there and make somebody smile today uh, because you never know who needs it. And if you do make somebody smile, man, you had a great day, in my opinion. And the world needs a lot more of that right now. So thank you all for listening. And I will see you on the other side. Thank you so much for your time today and listening to the podcast. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. With your support and our incredible guests, we're one of the top sales podcasts in the industry with over a million downloads. And I can't thank you enough. To keep the momentum going, if you could go to your favorite podcast platform and leave us a five-star review, I would greatly appreciate it. In return, I will answer any question that you have on Instagram. Hit me up there at John M as in Michael Barrows with a video question or a DM and I will get right back to you, I promise. And last but not least, if you're looking for training, I'm adjusting my training approach this year and I'm actually gonna be delivering training to the masses. I'll be delivering live training the first and second week of every single month with our two marquee courses, filling the funnel and driving a close to anybody who wants to join. And it includes membership in our on-demand platform with weekly AMAs. So you can go to jbarrows.com open to check out the details. Thanks again and have a great day.